Investors love earning a great rate of return. And that's clear. They don't like risk, uncertainty, the chance of losing a large portion of their money. We said risk and return are the two most important dimensions in investment decision-making. Therefore, it is easy to understand why we must spend a good portion of time to learn how to measure and forecast a security's risk. How can we define risk for an investor? If you invest $1,000 of your money in a stock, that's trading on the stock exchange, and you know that, on average, this stock earned 15%, you would want to know how the average was made, right? Whether the stock earned 14% in one year, then 16% the next year, 13% the year after that, and 17% in the last year of historical observations, or whether it earned plus 50%, minus 20%, minus 20% again, and then plus 50% in the final year. There's a big difference between the two sets of data, right? In the first case, you can be certain your money will earn an amount that is more or less in line with what you expect. Things can be slightly better or slightly worse, but the rate of return is always 13 to 17%. Things change dramatically with the second set of data. There is a huge variability from one year to the next. The average return is the same. However, you can't have an idea about what comes next. If you are an investor who holds the stock for two years, you can lose 40% of its value if the years when you hold the stock are years two and three. So, apparently, variability plays an important role in the world of finance. It is the best measure of risk we have. A volatile stock market is much more likely to deviate from its historical returns and surprise investors negatively. Yes, it can surprise investors positively too. However, investors don't like surprises and are much more sensitive to the possibility of losing their initial investment. Most people prefer to have a good idea about the rate of return they can expect from a security or a portfolio of securities, and are doing their best to reduce the risk they are exposed to. We need to remember that. Investors are risk-averse. They don't like risk for the sake of risk, and their main goal is to measure the risk they are facing and reduce it as much as possible. Commonly used statistical measures, such as variance and standard deviation, can help us a great deal when we try to quantify risk associated with the dispersion in the likely outcome. Such dispersion is measured by a security's variance and standard deviation. To be even more precise, the variance of a security measures the dispersion of a set of data points around their mean value. It is equal to the following algebra equation. The variance, S square, is equal to the sum of the squares of the difference between a data point X and the mean divided by N minus one. For those of you who haven't seen it, here is an example that should make things easier. The mean of the four data points is 15%, right? Great. Let's calculate the dispersion of each of the four points from the mean and elevate to the second degree. We'll have 14% minus 15% to the second degree, 16% minus 15% to the second degree, 13% minus 15% to the second degree, and 17% minus 15% to the second degree. These are the four dispersions from the mean elevated to the second degree. Let's calculate their sum. Once we have the sum, we have to divide by the number of observations we've had minus one. Here, we had four observations, so we'll have four minus one. I'll divide by three. The variance is equal to 0 0.00033. If we take the square root of the variance, we'll obtain the standard deviation of this sample of observations which is equal to 1.8%. Let's calculate the variance of the second set of numbers. We have to use the same formula for the four observations we have here. 50% minus 15% to the second degree. 
minus 20% minus 15% to the second degree. Again, minus 20% minus 15% to the second degree. And finally, 50% minus 15% to the second degree. Let's sum the four components, divide by three, and obtain the variance. As you can see, it is much larger in this case, 0.16, and the standard deviation is even higher, 40%. But we kind of expected it, didn't we? In this example, we knew the lowest and the highest returns were 35% away from the average value of 15%. So we obtained a close approximation once more. The second set of returns had a much larger dispersion and is a lot riskier. This is how we can calculate a stock's variance and standard deviation. We're doing well. In our next lesson, we'll learn how to do this in Python. Thanks for watching.